Oh, yeah, that's true. Does that get to be in the recording? No, I just don't know. Yes? What's that? Merch? I know, right? Like ties, calculators, I know. Okay, this is my channel is one of those YouTube channels where you wonder what the person looks like because all you ever hear is their voice or see their hands. Yeah. Like, um, how to basic. Yeah, exactly. Or, yeah. Just throw eggs at No. All right. A little bit. I'm closest to the mic, though, so it really just picks me up. I'm going to take a little bit of stuff. So anyway, we're going to learn a new technique for evaluating limits, right? Yeah. So again, evaluating limits, um, sometimes we, we you know, learn a technique. We, we would do that, like direct substitution, fractional canceling. That's a technique for evaluating a limit, OK, uh, using algebra. Right? We also, of course, have our technology available to us, so we can use our, our graphing calculators and the table method. That is something we can fall back to if need be. But today we're going to be adding a kind of like another skill <coughs> to our repertoire um, when it comes to evaluating limits. Okay, so let's take a look at this idea called a rationalization. <coughs> okay, so let's do an easy one here to start out. <coughs> How can we go about evaluating this limit? What could we do? Substitution. That's right. So let's try that, right? So 0 plus 1, right, under the square root, minus 1, all over x, which is also 0. And let's see. We do that. So 0 plus 1 is 1. The square root of 1 is 1. So it's 1 minus 1 over 0, which is then 0 over 0, which is indeterminate. Form. Okay. <clears throat> so that didn't help, right? Direct substitution, we get this kind of thing. Sometimes that means there's more going on. So what other option do we have then? Chart. With what we know, right? The chart, the table, okay. <clears throat> let's pull out our calculator here. And let's see, I'm going to put parentheses around this. Square root of x plus 1, Oop. minus 1, divided by x, okay, and then for our table, we're trying to approach 0, so if I'm trying to approach 0 from the left-hand side of 0, what would be some good numbers to pick here? <coughs> negative 0.1, negative 0 0.01, whoops, let me go at a step at a time, negative 0.001, negative 0 0.0001, I can go that, you know, something like that, okay, and I can go from the other side too, so positive 0.001, 0 0.001, 0 0.01, so on and so forth, okay? According to our table, does it look like there's a value to our limit here? Does it look like there's an answer? And if so, what do you think it might be? What's it look like we're approaching here as x approaches 0? 0.5 or 1 half. So like maybe this is equal to 1 half? Maybe it's equal to 1 half. A direct substitution yielded 0 over 0. There's no clear way here to like factor this, right? This doesn't really look like something that factors. Um, so that wouldn't really work. And, but, the, but the table, sure enough, seems to indicate that it would go to 1 half. So what can we do here? Well, let me show you. This is where we're going to be using that idea of rationalization. So I'll rewrite it. Okay. And what we're going to do is take advantage of a difference of squares. And we're going to multiply by the conjugate, if you remember that word, <coughs> from algebra 2 maybe. Conjugate? Well, no, I guess there is some sort of relation between it and language too, but I'm talking about conjugate from math, not conjugate from math. No, that's OK. I'm sure there is some sort of relationship. I don't know what it would be. So why am I doing this? Well, if you recall, right, let's take a look here. We've got this square root of x plus 1, we'll call that a, and then minus the 1, we'll call that b. And then I took the square root of x plus 1, which is that same a, but now I multiply by a plus b. 
And what do we know? A minus B times A plus B. What does that simplify to B? A squared minus B squared, right? It's a difference of squares, right? That's what, how you factor a difference of squares into A minus B times A plus B. So when you multiply them, then you get that difference of squares. So if that's the case, right? And you can just FOIL this too if you don't believe me. We'll multiply the first, right? What's root X plus 1 times root X plus 1? Well, we're multiplying it by itself, so it's going to be root x plus 1 quantity squared, right? Or just x plus 1 if you went ahead and simplified that. But I'll go ahead and write out the, I'll write it out, you know, more explicitly here with more steps. All right, so that was the first. Now the outer, outer is positive 1 times root x plus 1, so plus 1 root x plus 1. And then inner, right, foil, inner, so negative 1 times root x plus 1, so minus 1 root x plus 1. And then the last, negative 1 times positive 1, negative 1 all over, and then x times the quantity root x plus 1 plus 1, like that. <clears throat> I would recommend against distributing that denominator, and you'll see why in just a second. Okay, questions on just that step right there? Or anything prior to it, I guess I should say. Any, any questions thus far? We're all okay with the math? Okay. So, again, I brought this in out of nowhere. But it's okay for me to multiply by this thing because what, it's, what is its value really? It's 1, right? It's, it's something divided by itself. I'm multiplying by 1. I'm not changing the value of this. <clears throat> We're just utilizing uh, that to re rewrite in a different form. Okay. So root x plus 1 quantity squared, that leaves us with just, root x, or just the x plus 1, right? Because when you square a square root, it cancels out. You're left with x plus 1. What happens to this plus 1 root x plus 1 and the minus 1 root x plus 1? They cancel, right? They're exact opposites of each other. And then we have the minus 1 still in the numerator over and then x times root x plus 1 plus 1 like that in the denominator. <clears throat> okay. There's some further simplification we can do, right? What else can we simplify here? I think they need to see the nurse. The plus 1 and the minus 1, right? They're going to cancel because there's nothing in front of the parentheses. I could really drop the parentheses there and just say x plus 1 minus 1. They'll cancel. And so we're finally left with limit as x approaches 0 of x over x times root x plus 1 plus 1. But oh my gosh, what still cancels? The x's now. So what's left in the numerator? A 1, okay, yeah, don't forget the 1 in the numerator, over and the square root of x plus 1, plus 1, like that. <coughs> Isn't that fun, rewriting that limit as x approaches 0 every single step? No. Never get tired of it. Are you going to take points if you don't do that? I want you to do it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Will I take points off if you do it for every single problem? No, but if you, if you, if you do it, uh, I will probably, yeah. I'll probably take a point off or something like that. Why? Because it matters as part of your work there. Mm -hmm. Um, that would be okay if you can jump that much. But if you mess, if you mess up, then you're going to lose partial credit points because I won't know what you did. Yeah. Maybe like so you got some sort of mathematics there and did it. So, okay, that's not for you. I'm just going to leave it there. It's, it's, um, because <coughs> that's for calculus stuff. So, um, all right. So anyway, now what should we do? We simplified everything, <coughs> but now what? Now let's try a direct substitution. Okay, so we're going to have 1 over the square root of 0 plus 1, plus 1. 0 plus 1, 1. Square root of 1, 1. Plus 1, 2. And we get that 1 half that we thought we should have after many, many steps. Okay? So there, in fact, is that 1 half that our calculator gave us. Okay, right there. <clears throat> If this is too much writing for you, and you're thinking about doing calculus next year, you may want to rethink. Okay? Now that I'm saying that every problem in calculus is this long, or that you have to write this much for every single problem, but they're, they will show up on a fairly regular basis. Okay? And then it's just something you'll need to get used to. Okay? Um, 
So that's all. Okay. Not to scare you or anything, but that's just it. Yeah, for me, Kate. Sure. <clears throat> so, like, you may recall from, like, um, when you, like, were with imaginary numbers and stuff like that, you had something maybe, like, 1 over 2 minus i. And you multiply by the conjugate of this to kind of, like, simplify the i out of the denominator, and you multiply them by 2 plus i, 2 plus i like that. Okay? And you'd use the exact same, you'd take advantage of the exact same kind of thing we did up here with, like, the difference of squares. You create a difference of squares scenario here with that. And so the conjugate is just, like, Multiplying by kind of like the opposite binomial almost, but not the exact opposite. Just like if you have a minus one, just make a plus one kind of thing. Okay, that's all. So yeah. Writing a lot, would we ever have to do proofs ever again? Um, no, not in the sense like you do in geometry. No. Oh yes. If you continue in mathematics like into college, then yes, for sure, you will eventually get to proofs. Eventually, math becomes more about the proofs and less about this kind of um, what I would call like uh, calculations or. Uh, I don't know. It becomes more conceptual and less procedural, right? This is more like a procedure we're following here. It becomes more conceptual. So, yeah. Yeah, yes, awesome. Sometimes it's awesome when the proofs make sense. Okay. Let's try another one. Let's try another one here, and then I'll have you guys try one. <clears throat> okay. Now, you may kind of get, tr you know, you may kind of like get into the habit of once you see a square, and that's supposed to be three minus the square root of x plus seven. There, I don't know if I did a very good job of showing that. Three minus the square root of x plus seven. Okay, it's supposed to be three minus that. <coughs> Are you making into the habit of when you see a square root? Just go ahead and start rationalizing, right? But don't get into that habit yet, okay? You really want to try direct substitution first. Sometimes direct substitution will work. Just because you see a square root doesn't guarantee you have to do rationalization. But that being the case, since we are in the notes for rationalization and I want to practice another one, there's a very good chance this one will require us to rationalize. And if we try direct substitution, we get 0 in the numerator. We get 2 plus 7, which is 9. Square root of 9 is 3. 3 minus 3 is 0. We get 0 over 0. So, of course. Mr. Witt set it up so that we would have to rationalize. All right. So that being said, right, Ramike, do you want to take a shot at what would be the conjugate that we're going to multiply by here? Ah, so that would be a conjugate for the x minus 2. But the x minus 2 isn't what's causing the problem here. We want to deal with the square root. And so what would be the conjugate of the square root term here? Yes, very good. We want to multiply by 3 plus root x plus 7 over 3 plus root x plus 7 there. <coughs> okay, that is what was giving us the issue. So. I didn't leave myself very much space, so I'll just continue down here. <coughs> okay, so in the numerator, again, don't multiply that out. In this case, right, the x minus 2 and the 3 plus root x plus 7, leave that, <coughs> excuse me, un, <coughs> undistributed. In this case, it's in the numerator. <coughs> okay. And the denominator, well, again, we're going to have that difference of squares situation, right? So the first will be 3 times 3, 9. Okay. The outer will be a positive 3 root x plus 7. The inner will be a negative 3 root x plus 7. So that middle term is going to what? Cancels, Cancels out, right? And so then we're just going to be left with minus the quantity root x plus 7 squared, right? A negative root x plus 7 times a positive root x plus 7 is going to be minus root x plus 7 squared, okay? I left out writing out the actual middle term and canceling just because it's more writing than we need to do. You can skip steps if you'd like to, you know, kind of thing. All right, let's simplify here then. <clears throat> Again, leaving that x minus 2 and leaving the 3 plus the root x plus 7 in the numerator there. <clears throat> All right, so x plus 7 quantity squared, 9 minus the quantity x plus 7. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. 
which then if we distribute the minus sign and combine like terms there, we end up with the limit as x approaches 2 of x minus 2 times 3 plus root x plus 7 all over. And then this is going to be, so what will be in the denominator now at this next step? <coughs> what are we going to have? The minus sign would distribute. That's what will be left over when we combine like terms and distribute that minus. Yeah, Riley? I'm confused. Okay. <coughs> when you square the square root, you're left with just the x plus 7. There's a lot going on, yeah. Okay, but, but my question still stands. What well, would simplify? How would that denominator simplify? What would it simplify to be? Yeah, go ahead, Megan. Negative x plus 2, right? Minus would distribute to the x. We have a negative x. 9, take away the 7, right, because the minus distributes to the 7, too. 9 minus 7. <clears throat> so plus 2. <clears throat> okay. Uh-oh. We have x minus 2. We have negative x plus 2. They don't cancel. But Megan? Yeah, so, so these things are exact opposites of each other. So if I just take one more step to write that limit as x approaches 2, you know, one more time at least, <coughs> we'll have what we need. Okay, so yeah, this is negative 1 times x, whoop, x minus 2. And so the x minus 2's cancel, and we're left with the limit as x approaches 2 of negative Three plus the square root of x plus seven, <coughs> and then finally we can do what? <clears throat> Plug in the two. Two plus seven is nine. Root nine is three. Three plus three is six. So it's negative six. <clears throat> yes. Tears of joy yes, for how definitely. fun this is. Okay. Yes. Focus on the positive square root. Because it's going to equal negative 3 and 0. <coughs> say, say, say it again, sorry. When you, add, when you substitute x with 2 and square root 9, it would be negative 3, 2. Oh, I see what you're saying. So, um, question is, Mr. Wid, in certain situ situations, certain scenarios, you seem to be, well, Mr. Wid, you seem to be kind of like, you know, contradicting yourself. In certain situations, Mr. Witt, when you take the square root of something, you're like, uh, 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 don't forget that plus or minus. But now here, where I'm taking the square root of this, I say, oh, it's 3, not negative 3. What's the difference? Well, it has to do with whether we are in an equation or whether we are just kind of coming across the square root of 9 in the wild, so to speak. Right? So when you see, like, a wild root 9 appear, that is just 3. Okay? Because we take the primary root to simplify this. So, like, if you were like doing, you know, if you were given a problem like, okay, what is you know this plus this minus two times three to the second, you know, doing whatever kind of thing, that would just simplify to three. But of course, then in the equation situation, the difference is that in an equation you're trying to find all the possible values of x that make the equation true. That's why you want to put plus or minus three in. For this, we just take root nine and three. That's it. Okay. So, is that you do? I mean, do you believe me on that, or do you buy what I just sold you there, I guess? Yeah. Okay, because that's basically the idea, okay? Because <coughs> I had that question, too, and I was like, huh, and I looked it up, and yeah, it's just, it has to do with the, using the primary root. All right, any other questions for me before I give you one to try on your own? No? Oh, you guys are just eager to try one? Gotcha. All right, here we go. Limit as x approaches 0 of the square root of x plus 9 uh, minus 3 all over x. <clears throat> yes? Are we doing anything with this graph? Yes, we will be, on the, uh, just in the next, like on what we're going on in the back. So Do yes. <clears throat> yes, I know. I know, Cooper. It's very exciting. Very exciting day for a Monday. Uh, yes. Only if you procrastinated them to the last minute. Cooper, I'm going to give you a clipboard, and you can tell me how much you deserve. You think you deserve. All right. Just kidding. You get it done. You, I mean, if you want to procrastinate, that's your choice. I was, I, I like you. I do. Do your question, please. No, I was just saying, I'm going to lose this track. Do you want to?
That's right. That's right. And he's going to get it done still. He still has time to get it done. He's not late. <coughs> You're not sure how to start it? No. <sighs> Multiply by the card. <coughs> so I see this. So you square this, right? Yeah. So you're going to multiply by root x plus 9 plus 3. I got minus 5. Oh, okay. So you multiply root x plus 9 plus 3. Yeah. Yeah. X plus 9. It's Is it really? I feel like you should cut that one out and like start a, like a start like a you know a, a Hall of Fame or something. Oh, question.
Do, 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 do. So let's take a look here, right? We'll multiply. Ooh, there it goes. Okay. Actually, I'll just continue in the red, I guess. When you FOIL this out, you get x plus 9 minus 9 over x times the quantity x plus 9 plus 3. The 9s will cancel, the x's will cancel, and so then you plug in the 0, and, oops, I'm not going to do that anymore, 1 over the square root of 9 plus 3, which is 3 plus 3, so 1 sixth is your final answer there. Okay. Questions on that last one there? We're going to flip over to the back, if not. So, I guess I just said you Oh, you didn't give the nines. Oh, wait, never mind. No questions? Hey, there we go. Okay. This is probably like one of the hardest things we've done so far in this class, which maybe isn't saying much because some of you guys are like, this whole class is a bit easy, but all right, that's your opinion. But this is pretty tricky still, nonetheless. Okay, this is new, right, which is like even more mind-blowing, but oops, what am I doing? I want to go to the back of that paper. Okay, so back to our graph. And we want to be also, this is our third method of evaluating limits, right, or three kind of umbrella methods, right? We have... The first thing we did was with a table, that's numeric, right? The second one is like um, analytical, right, which uses algebra and calculus. I would classify, you know, this rationalization that falls underneath the analytical method, okay, because we use it to find the exact, you know, limit itself. And then finally we have the graphical approach, which is this right here. So we're going to evaluate limits graphically too, okay? You can see over here we have a very peculiar, a pretty peculiar graph. <coughs> okay, complete with a vertical asymptote, a hole, um, and then you know just some weird behavior. Okay, it looks probably more like a piecewise function than anything else. <coughs> but anyway, so let's take a look at some of these limits here. All right, so let's just think about some of them. So the first one, we'll take the limit as x approaches negative two of f of x. And again, this right here is the graph of f of x. Okay. So as x approaches negative 2, what does it look like our function is approaching? To what value? 3. So as x approaches negative 2, as we approach negative 2 from the right and from the left, both sides of our graph are approaching this y value of 3. Okay. At negative 2, well, we'll get to that in just a second. So, yeah, we'll say the limit here is 3. Okay, that is the answer. What is f of negative 2, though? What's that equal to? 4, right? At negative 2, not approaching negative 2. At negative 2, you go up, 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 up through that hole to the filled in point there at 4. So it is negative 2, 4. Okay? You'll notice here... The limit as x approaches negative 2 and the value of the function at negative 2 are two different values, which indicates the function should be discontinuous. Do we agree? Is the function discontinuous at negative 2? Yes, right? There's a hole there, okay? Discontinuous. All right. So one aspect of being a function being continuous is that the limit and the value of the function must be the same. Clearly here they are different. Okay, there's, there's two other properties, and I don't know if we get to continuity or not, but anyway. All right, let's try another one. The limit as x approaches 1 of f of x. What is the limit as x approaches 1 of the function? <coughs> what do we say here? Zero. zero. Yeah, it's going to be 0. Okay, again, as we approach 1, this one's very clearly going to be that. Okay, and what is f of 1? What is the value of the function at 1? Not approaching at 1. Zero again, yeah. <coughs> is the function continuous at one? Looks like it is, right? It's pointy, but that's okay. Yeah. Okay, it's pointy, but that's okay. It is continuous at one. Okay. This is not sufficient alone. Okay. It's um, it's necessary that this is true for it to be continuous, but it's not sufficient. Okay. It's not. There's like two other things we have to look at, but again, we're not going about those right now. Okay. Next, what about the limit as x approaches three of f of x? What do we want to say here? 
Okay, we can say infinity or the limit does not exist. Exactly right. Because what does the concept of limit imply? It implies a limit. Is infinity limited? Right? No. So we would say here the limit does not exist, as Lindsay Lohan would say from, or Lohan would say from Mean Girls there. Okay? The limit does not exist. The problem she was doing in Mean Girls, by the way, you can't do it without calculus, so. But we can still use the phrase limit does not exist to describe things. What about f of 3? What's that? Undefined? Yeah, undefined. I'd also accept does not exist there, too. Okay, there's an asymptote there. <coughs> okay, except either one. Both are accurate. Okay. So what's what am I trying to what can I summarize here? Well, what's the point I'm trying to make with this? There is a point actually. The existence or non-existence. Okay of f of x at x equals c has no bearing on the existence <clears throat> or non-existence okay, of the limit as x approaches c of f of x. Okay. <clears throat> whether the value of the function exists at a certain point, or whether the value of a function does not exist at a certain point, does not bear at all on the existence or non-existence of the limit at a certain point, with one exception, right? If the function is continuous. So here, for example, our function is discontinuous, and that's why this holds true. If you further stipulate that your function is also continuous, then the existence of the function at a certain point will precisely depend on the value, the value of the limit, and vice versa, too. Okay? So notice, nowhere in here are we assuming the function is continuous, all right? which is a little confusing for us, because like 99% of the functions that we ever deal with are continuous everywhere. And so this is like kind of, we assume, because something's a function, it's also continuous. But that's not so. A function does not always have to be continuous. And that's why this statement is here. Okay. This is a function, right? It passes the vertical line test. It is not continuous. And so there you see why we have places where the limit exists, but the function doesn't exist, and where the function exists, but the limit doesn't exist. Kind of thing. Okay. Well, actually, there's no situation where that happens, but I could draw you one if you want to see. Kind of thing. Okay. But they don't bear on each other unless the function is also continuous. <clears throat> okay. Questions on that? <clears throat> I got a little bit more for us. We're not done yet. Oh, man, I know we're really pushing it today, Mr. Wid, but that's the way we got to do it. Okay, limits at infinity. <coughs> we're going to turn a little bit of a corner here, not too much, but just a little. I got to squeeze this in. My, my apologies. Okay, so that means, so what do I mean by limits at infinity? That means the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x. <clears throat> okay, or the limit as x approaches negative infinity of f of x. <clears throat> what happens to the value of the function? Okay, you've already been doing this <clears throat> without realizing it. What's, what's the behavior that we've been talking about that utilizes these two ideas? It's the end behavior. It's exactly the end behavior, right? This is the limit as x approaches infinity of the function. That is asking you what happens to the function as x goes really, really, really far to the right, right? That's what x is approaching infinity. Or x approaches negative infinity. What happens to the function as you go really, really, really far to the left? Okay. So how do we evaluate these? Now that we have the concept of limits, well, we're going to use some guidelines here to help us out. So guidelines for evaluating there is like a discovery activity I could do, but it just takes too long for us. And I want to make sure we get this through. So I'm going to do some bad teaching here. Not give you guys the opportunity to figure out for yourself. And maybe you've already seen it before. Well, in fact, I'm pretty sure you have seen it before. Okay, and this is for rational functions. Okay, 
rational functions. <coughs> so this is how we can evaluate limits at infinity for rational functions. Okay, there's three scenarios that we're going to be concerned about. If the degree of the numerator is greater than the degree of the denominator. Okay, and if you'll permit me, I'll just abbreviate here to kind of speed things along. <clears throat> okay, what does that mean? That means that the limit as x approaches infinity or the limit as x approaches negative infinity, the limit will not exist. Okay, for an example of this, we can think back to all those polynomials that we did, right? All those polynomials, they had a, they had a numerator, but they didn't have a denominator, right? They, they, weren't, they were over 1, you could say, and the degree, of over, the degree of 1 is 0, right? So all of our polynomials, they have bigger degrees than the numerator because they are just the numerator, basically. The denominator is just the degree of 0. And so your numerator's degree is always greater, and that's why we end up with that end behavior that goes off to positive infinity or goes off to negative infinity, right? And therefore, the limit does not exist, okay? <clears throat> limit does not exist. Number two, right? So there's other scenarios. For example, if the degree of the numerator is the same as the degree of the denominator. Again, I'm going to abbreviate there just to make it easier for ourselves. <clears throat> okay, the limit... is equal to the ratio of the lead coefficients. So here the limit will exist. Okay, If the degree of the numerator and the degree of the denominator are the same, what that means as you approach infinity, the numerator and the denominator are kind of getting bigger at the same rate. So while you do have a big, a big numerator, you're also dividing by a big denominator. And so it's going to work out that those ratios are going to be exactly equal to each other. So that's just the ratio of the lead coefficients will be your final answer for the limit. And that's where you get the idea of a horizontal asymptote and stuff like that. And then finally, our last scenario, if the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator, or in other words, if the denominator's degree is bigger, <clears throat> well, what happens if you have something that's got a large denominator and the denominator is getting greater and greater and greater than that numerator. What overall, what's the overall value of that going to approach? Zero, right? If your denominator is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and your numerator just can't keep up with it, then the limit will go to zero. Okay. <clears throat> so we'll do three quick examples here. I know we're rushing, but I just want to make sure we get through it here. Okay. Questions on anything so far? This should be pretty familiar to you from your horizontal asymptote stuff you guys had to do back in Algebra 2. Okay, but now we're putting it in the context of limits because that's really what you're doing when you evaluate a horizontal asymptote. You're finding the end behavior, which is merely the limit as x approaches infinity or the limit as x approaches negative infinity. <coughs> All right, so I'll do three examples here. So the limit as x approaches infinity of 2x plus 5 over... 3x squared plus 1. Okay, and I'll try and slow down here because I know you guys are trying to catch up. So, Okay, 2x plus 5 over 3x squared plus 1. <clears throat> okay, what is the degree of the numerator? 1. What's the degree of the denominator? Two, so it's it's our third scenario right here, right? The degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator, and so we know this limit should approach zero, and it will be zero, okay? If you whoop, if you um think about it here, right? That denominator is going to be squared, right? If you imagine kind of like substituting in infinity here, infinity gets squared as opposed to just two times infinity, okay? So infinity squared much bigger than infinity by itself, and so that denominator gets bigger much faster, so it goes to zero. All right, let's try another one here. The limit as x approaches infinity of 2x squared plus 5 over 3x squared plus 1.
What's the degree of the top here? Two. two. Degree of the bottom? Two. two. So it's that second case. Degree of the numerator is the same as the degree of the denominator. So it's the, the ratio of the lead coefficients. So in other words, this is going to equal what? Two thirds. Yeah, that's all there is to it there. Okay. And you can probably guess which scenario we're going to end up with for this last one. Okay. Limit is x approaches infinity. 2x to the third <laughs> plus 5 over, <coughs> excuse me, 3x squared plus x plus 1. <coughs> For number three, what's the degree of the top? Three, degree of the bottom? Two. So we say this thing is going to go to infinity. But Mr. Wid, wait a minute. This denominator has an x squared. It's going to be infinity squared, but it's going to be plus infinity. This is only infinity cubed. Are you trying to say infinity cubed is more than infinity squared plus infinity? Yes. Yes. As numbers get larger, cubing a very large number is going to be way more, you know, uh, I guess, powerful, I guess, or sub, sub, substantial, then squaring it and adding it to itself, okay? <clears throat> if you're unsure, you can also use your calculator here to check this out. So let me just show you, for example, 2x squared plus 5 over 3x squared plus 1, okay? You can go to your table on your calculator. How can I mimic on my calculator approaching infinity, my x value approaching infinity? What should I type in here? Yeah, just like large and large numbers, right? Like 10,000 uh, 10, or, you know, just, oops, I kept a. Right, and your calculator basically just like gives up. It's like, there it is, right? That decimal is 0.6 repeating two thirds. Okay. <clears throat> so you can also use your calculator to help you figure that out too, or check your work, I would say. So there we are. Those are the horizontal asymptotes as well, and we'll make more connection with that um, in a little bit too. But for right now, that's that's sufficient for what we need. Okay, your homework will be posted in Google Classroom. So, oh, yeah, Megan, sorry, question. Um, I'll let you have this question. So we'll try. How So in each one of these cases, um, it would, so for example, this case, you'd have negative number divided by a positive number, so it'd be negative, but since the denominator is going to get bigger, if you approach zero from the negative side or positive side, it's still going to go to zero. Like the denominator here will still be going towards zero because you're still dividing by a very large negative, or sorry, it's still a large number, but it'll be negative, but still goes to zero. For this one, they're both the same. So since they're squared, it's going to be positive over positive anyway. But let's just say it was like cubed and cubed, well, you still have then a negative infinity over a negative infinity. The negatives would cancel. You'd still be positive anyway. So it would still go to whatever the lead coefficients are because they cancel. And then for this one, uh, same idea. It's just it would be so in this case it would be negative infinity. It would change if it was if it was like a negative infinity here. This would go to negative infinity. But you would still say ultimately the limit does not exist. But this one would be a negative infinity, and the reason for that is because. One sec. The reason for it is because negative infinity cubed would be a negative infinity divided by that would be positive infinity. So negative divided, well, it would be negative over positive, so it would be neg it would go to negative infinity. So if this was like, <coughs> you use the signs to help you figure it out. Yeah. That's all. These would be, so this one right here, if it was negative infinity, it would be negative infinity squared, negative infinity squared, so it would be positive anyway. If it was cubed and cubed, it would be negative infinity divided by a negative infinity, so it would still become positive anyway. So would you be negative infinity and plug it in versus like, I mean, you can, you can, I guess my point is you can kind of see it wouldn't make a difference. If I did, if this, if this is approaching negative that infinity, yeah. it would be positive and positive. Or if it was cubed and cubed, it would still be a negative divided by negative, make it positive anyway, two thirds. Bye guys, have a good day. If you need set, let me know. And then this one, same idea, it would go to zero. It doesn't matter whether it's positive or negative because it's going down to zero. Well, if this was approaching negative infinity, this would be negative. But then you negative infinity squared, positive. But you're but it's such a, but this is going to get bigger faster than this. Oh, I see. And so it. it's going to shrink it down to zero, so even if you're matters. positive or negative. Exactly, no matter oh, okay. what the sign is. Thank you. Yep. If it goes to zero, it goes to zero. Proud, okay? Oh, all your interim grades. Oh yes. <laughs> Whoa, Mr. Witt, I hear he's a hard grader. You got an A in his class. Whoa, Maddie, what's up? Oh, stuff for me. Thanks. Oh, that's not really disappointing.
What's that? You sounded really disappointed. You're like, oh. Oh, thanks. I was hoping it was a present.